Hey everybody, I just wanted to take a second and talk to you a little bit about how to prepare for these essay questions that are on this second exam. You might be wondering to yourself, why are we doing essay tests? I know a lot of students really kind of get nervous about essay tests and uh, dread them in a lot of ways. But the reason that we choose essay exams, there's a couple of really main reasons. The first is that we have an emphasis here at Snow College on writing through the curriculum. So learning how to express yourself through writing, uh, crafting a clear and concise essay is an important um, kind of goal that we have for you to learn as students at Snow College and essay exams really help you do that. The second reason that we do that is because you'll be surprised at how much more uh, information you retain and how more how much more clearly you understand that information when you're preparing for an essay exam. With multiple choice, you can just kind of like mostly know it, but you don't really have to be able to explain it, right? You can kind of just vaguely connect. Uh, one answer in the multiple choice question to the actual question itself. But in, in an essay exam, you actually have to know yeah. the information. So yeah. I've got a cute little baby yeah. helping me out. Yeah. Uh, you have to know the information and you have to know how to explain the information clearly and how to link it to other relevant yeah. ideas. So it's a great way for you to use your critical thinking skills, use your analytical skills, look through all of the information that's been presented to you in the class and choose what's the most relevant using those critical skills and then really be able to kind of analyze how is the best way to portray this information what ideas should i link this information to all of those skills are really fundamental for writing an essay so you're getting some extra oomph with an essay exam that you don't get with multiple choice sorry that you dread it it's going to be great don't worry So we're going to have written essays counting for half of your grade on this exam as well as the final exam. So it says here to use your notes, these are the instructions for the essay portion. Use your notes and the information in the modules to answer only five of the following questions. Everyone has to choose either question six or seven and then you choose four more, whichever ones you'd like. So I have this little blurb in here. I want you to just notice that I said, please use your notes and the information in the modules to answer. Now, I've even seen some of this on some of the assignments that you've turned in. The reason that I'm asking you to pay attention to your notes and the information for the modules is because those points that I make in the course of the modules are the points that I feel are the most essential to understanding that period of art. If you get on Google, you're going to get all sorts of information and sometimes where you students most likely don't have a lot of art history background, wading through all of that information and trying to choose what is the most important, what is the most essential, what is the most fundamental can be really overwhelming. So if you use Google, you're going to have tons of information that you're going to try and choose from. Maybe you'll choose the most relevant information or you can just take the extra 30 seconds go back to the module and find out what we think in this class the most essential information is. So it's really a much easier process than just trying to search through a bunch of information on the internet. So once you have chosen the information you want to include, make sure that you're putting all of it in your own words. You're going to submit things through Turnitin. And if you're not familiar with what that program is, it is a plagiarism checker that runs through the Canvas system. Anything from the websites, anything from online comes up in Turnitin and shows me word for word exactly what it says on the website and word for word exactly what you said. And it will tell me exactly the percentage that matches. So it will say, uh, you know, in this, in this passage, you can see that this student has pretty much just cut and paste. Uh, if you do cut and paste, if you do plagiarize, whether it's from the internet, whether it's from the module, that question will have to receive a zero. Now, I've been pretty lenient on you guys as far as citing your information. I've asked quite a few times for you to use in-text citations in your assignments. And there are so many of you who are using uh, just maybe a bibliography at the end or using some in-text citations, some of you not. There are some of you who are doing a really wonderful job at using in-text citations, but just make sure that um, in a test situation, I'm going to be a lot more strict on something like that. No plagiarism, 
Uh, make sure that you're totally avoiding that, rewording everything very clearly and very differently in your own words. And that helps you retain the information too, so it's a, a benefit that way. Now, I'm not going to go through and look at your writing and uh, be really critical on your grammar or your sentence structures, but I do need to understand what you're saying. So I need you to write clear, complete sentences, uh, and if you don't do that, then you won't be able to receive full credit for the, for the writing portion. So these are the options that you have for this first exam. There are eight options. Everyone has to write on either question six or question seven. So choose one of those for sure, six or seven. And then after that, you can choose whichever four are interesting to you. Um, what I thought that we would do is I thought we would take question one since it's the first one and that I would just show you how I would prepare to answer that question and the ideas that I think are important to answering that question. Um, you, if you're watching this and you're being a good student, being really um, you're diligent in trying to prepare for the exam, you can use all of the information I'm giving you and use question one for one of your essays. So I'm pretty much just giving you the answer here, showing you how to prepare. Uh, you'll have question one already finished and then you can use these techniques to go on and answer the remaining questions. Okay, so question one says, considering politics and religion, explain the static and unchanging nature of Egyptian artistic style. Use at least one example to illustrate identified by title, artist, if known, and date. So what I want you to do is kind of take the question piece by piece. So we're talking about politics and religion. Make sure that we talk about both of those. And what we're going to talk about is discussing why Egyptian artistic style doesn't change very much. And we're going to kind of explain that using politics and religion. And we're going to show that using one example. Now, it's pretty rare at this uh, point for us to know the artist. So most likely you won't know that. But all of that information would be in the module. So the first thing I would do if I were going to be the one answering this question is I would open up the module and go to um, the very first page, 4.0, that introductory page that has all of the main objectives, the things that we should know, and all of the terms that we should know by the time we are done with this module. So we're gonna click on that, and it brings it up here. There's a little bit of an introduction, then it shows you the objectives, some of the main ideas you should understand by the time we get done with the module, and then some terms. If we look at these objectives, we can see uh, how there's a couple of those main ideas that you were supposed to already be paying attention to and already kind of writing down in your notes that we would use here. Uh, we've got that religion and politics are connected uh, and that they use divine right here in Mesopotamia and Egypt. That's kind of two thirds of the way down. And then we see here the very last uh, bullet point how the conservatism of Egyptian religion and politics was reflected in the unchanging nature of Egyptian art. So hopefully you've already kind of paid attention to these, these ideas as you were going through the module the first time and you have some notes. And we go down here to the terms to know. We want to kind of look through thinking about politics and religion. We want to look and make sure that we're using all of the terms uh, that are going to be relevant from the get-go. Now, probably what I would do at this point is I would go into the module and look through the information and then come back to this terms to know. Because uh, for you, you probably are looking at these terms and maybe you've written them down in your notes, being a really great student and the definitions. And you can kind of pick out some already that are relevant. But it might be, since this is a couple weeks ago, that you don't really remember exactly what relates to this question and what doesn't. So we can go ahead and take a look in the module to, to kind of refresh our memory and then come back here to this terms to know page. Okay, so I'm back uh, at the module pages. And when I'm looking here, I can see that I've got four pages that talk about ancient Egypt. The first one is an introductory page, 4.8, and then I've got one that talks about sculpture, one that talks about painting, and one that talks about architecture. Okay, so you can see that I've just clicked on that first uh, page that's going to be kind of the Egypt culture and history and art kind of page. This is a great place to start. I'm reading through what I have in historical context and right in the very first paragraph I see something that is relevant to the question that we're discussing. 
So I want to include that there, that it's this whole big period of Egyptian history where it doesn't change very much. Then I look through, I look at my notes from those videos to see if there's anything there that I want to include. Looking here at the religious context, what is relevant to this question? Um, the information from the videos, again, check your notes. Is there anything there that's important to include? Um, looking right here, it looks like I've got something that I for sure don't want to overlook. It's talking about how religion and politics work together in Egypt and kind of keep power and they didn't want things to change. So that's one of the reasons behind that whole kind of static nature of Egyptian art. When I come down here a little further, I can see there's even more information that's relevant. It's talking about the canon of proportion in the grid system. Uh, and it's saying how this really helped kind of create that regular static artistic style without changes. So that's an important tool of how they did it. And then it tells me another reason why, right? This kind of reflects that whole kind of continuity that they had in religious um, belief in Egypt about the afterlife and about the Ka, right? The spirit and how that spirit is something that just continues on forever. Uh, all of that is reflected then in the unchanging kind of static, repetitive approach that we see so often in Egyptian artworks. Okay, so there on that first page, I found quite a bit of information of what I want to include, what would be relevant to the question. Then I'm going to come down here to the bottom right and go to the next page and see what other information I can find. Okay, here I am on the next page. I'm looking through. It's talking about this example. It's talking about the Egyptian style that we see here. Um, then it's got two different works of art they're comparing in terms of the patron of the work and the style there. Then there's some information from the videos. Um, I'm not really seeing anything right here that tells me um, really specific information about what I want to be talking about in this question. So I'm just going to click next and see what comes up. Okay, so here I am on the painting page. I'm reading about books of the dead. Uh, and I see some information here actually that's relevant to what I want to talk about. Uh, it's talking about how there's similar styles through the painting and the relief sculpture. So that would be something that's relevant if I'm talking about how style doesn't really change. I could say that it's true, you know, in many different art forms, we have the same kind of style. So we're talking about this next example. And then after it talks about this example of Hugh Neffer, it talks about something called the Amarna period. This is definitely something I'd want to bring up for this question. Uh, it starts out right here saying, you know, even though we've said quite a few times that artistic style in Egypt doesn't change very much, politics and religion doesn't change very much, there is an exception. And it's this exception called the Amarna period, as it explains. It's just a short 15 year period where uh, we don't really see a lot, a lot of change. Um, sorry. I just said that backwards, where we see quite a bit of change because we have a new pharaoh who changes the religious systems away from uh, the polytheistic beliefs and to monotheism. And he, along with this change in new religion, changes the capital of Egypt and changes the artistic style. And so we have this exception to the continuity of Egyptian artistic style there. Okay. If I go on, you can see that the page kind of jumped ahead of me, sorry. If I go on and take a look at what comes next on the next page, we've got some information about architecture, um, some things about pyramids and mastabas, information on some videos. You know, really the Egyptians and their architecture were quite innovative and they do change quite a bit in architecture, which is different from uh, their other artistic kinds of um, forms. Okay, so that's really the information then from the modules that I need to include. So now that I've been here and looked it through, what I want to do now is return back to my terms to know page and see what would be relevant to include. All right, so here I am. I'm looking here. I see some things that are, you know, the beginning here of this list that are part of Egyptian uh, terms, but also are specific to the other periods. Um, looking through, I can see that theocratic state, that would be something that I want to bring up, right? That's where religion and politics work hand in hand, where the leader 
of the political state is also the leader of the religious sphere. And that's definitely true in Egypt and where this question is asking about how you know, religion and politics kind of are working hand in hand to keep art the same. That would be a term I would want to work in when I'm talking about um, about the two. I can see monotheism and polytheism. We just barely mentioned that, right? Those would be terms to throw in when I'm just defining what the Amarna period is. The Amarna period is a time when the polytheistic religious system in Egypt was changed to a monotheistic system. Along with the changes in religion, there was a change in the capital and a change in the artistic style. Right? That's about all the information that you would need to give about the Amarna period. You could probably also include that it's, it's pretty brief. And looking down on the list some more, we can kind of skip those ones. I've scrolled down a little bit here. Let's see, divine right would be another term that I'd probably want to include. That goes along with explaining the theocratic state. The Pharaoh felt like he was essentially appointed to his role by uh, the gods and he had then, you know, utmost authority. That would be something to explain. Okay, I see a couple here, grid system and canon of proportions. That uh, Those are tools that they use to kind of keep art looking the same and to keep the human figure looking the same in their representations of art. So that would be important to include. Amarna period, we already mentioned that earlier when we were talking about the terms above, but obviously we wanna make sure that we include um, that, that term. Okay, I think that we've kind of gone through all of that. So we can see that we're including the terms, we're explaining some of those important modules. We should be pretty much prepared to answer this question for the exam. So this is basically the information that's gonna form the, the foundation of my essay. This is the information that I wanna include here for essay one. I wanna talk about how religion, religion and politics kind of keep the balance of power between themselves and keep um, their authority in place. And when I'm talking about that, I wanna make sure to use the term theocratic state and, and define it, define right and define it and polytheism. Then I'm gonna to wanna to go on and talk about how the style is similar throughout the mediums and over this huge long period of time because religion and politics are trying to keep everything unchanged. I wanna go on and explain that there's even more reason for that by talking about Egyptian religion, how there's an emphasis on the eternal and the unchanging in Egyptian religion because they have that belief in the afterlife, because they have that belief of the Ka that kind of remains uh, present forever. And that too contributes to this kind of similar style, this static unchanging style that we have over this long period of time. I wanna explain how the grid system and the canon of proportions, after I define those terms, I wanna explain how they kind of keep uh, the depiction of the human form regular throughout all that time. And then I probably wanna wrap up my question by saying, you know, there is one exception to this during the Amarna period when we have a change uh, in the Pharaoh who changes things to monotheism, changes the capital, and changes the artistic style. But I wanna acknowledge that that's just a short little period, right? It's about 15 years and then it's over and done with and we kind of return back to that more conservative traditional style of the Egyptians. So I hope this has been helpful. I, uh, I know this is a little bit of a long video, but hopefully it's giving you the tools that you need now to go on and prepare to answer all of the other essay questions that you can do really well on the exam. If you have any questions at all while you're preparing, you can always send me an email or give me a call. Good luck.